I have to admit, I was waiting for you guys to sing more today. Okay. Well, we're at a junction in the book of Joshua. Some of you may peek ahead and said, Pastor, there's not much left in the book of Joshua. Well, I hope you did peek ahead because that's what you're supposed to say. Because pretty much from chapter 12, 12 is the halfway point, and it's sort of a summary chapter. That's all. Just summarizes what has happened. And then 13 is like in reverse. It records the last chapter. Almost exactly the same, but a little bit different. There's some things in there. And then 14 through 19 of Joshua, six chapters, are the dividing up of the land. And then 19 through 21 is the dividing the land to the Levites. And then 22, the three and a half tribes return and something happens that paves the way for the book of Judges. If we didn't have 22, we may not know why they wrote Judges, okay, or how they got Judges. And then 23 and 24 are, jo are Joshua's final sermon. So there it is. That's the summation of the rest of the book. Not a lot of sermons there, but there is some sermons, okay? But some of the chapters will be combined because it is pretty much dividing up the land. And even if you read last night or this week, chapter 12, and you said, what's the pastor going to do with chapter 12? You'll notice that it pretty much sums up what has happened to the land. Now, me in particular, I kind of like 12 and 13 because I guess I see more in it than just the victories. But you realize 12 and 13 sum up the victories, the victories that Moses got and the victories that Joshua got. Now, if you're somebody who likes comparing things, Joshua conquered 31 kings, Moses only two. So that would kind of say what? Joshua is a little bit better? I would hope you wouldn't say that. Because what happened to Moses? Does anyone know what happened to Moses? They went and looked for his body, and what happened? They didn't even find the body. What did God do with the bones? Does anyone know? Because we know the bones didn't go to heaven, did they? He was transformed in the twinkling of an eye as that chariot came down, okay? And somebody mentioned Jude 7. Is that what it is, Jude 7? That says that Michael the archangel contend, uh, contended with, uh, um, does it say Satan or the devil there? I think the devil. Over the body of Moses, Lord rebuke you. No one found it. So maybe just two nations were not that big of a deal, but they were a big deal. Because these two nations of the Amorites were so powerful that they covered masses of land. They covered the whole east of Jordan that parallels the land of Israel. All Joshua did was went to 31 cities, okay? And when we do the allotment of the land, you're going to see that actually Manasseh, Gad, and uh, half of Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben actually had a lot more than 31 cities. They had a lot more than 31 cities. So their land encompassed the whole land of Israel. It equaled the 31 kings, but there was only two kings. And they were famous. These kings they have found in Cuneiform tablets. They found these kings. Sihon king, okay, of Heshbon, okay, and Og, king of Bashan. Doesn't it sound very powerful to you? The thing about Og is Og was actually what? Does anyone know the significance of Og? Og was the remnant of the giants. It says that his bed was 13 feet long and made out of iron, Rudy. Iron. Is that a big bed? 
I don't know, we're kind of glad ours is wood, not iron. I think if Cadiz fell off of it and hit it and kicked it, we wouldn't want an iron bed. Does anyone have iron beds anymore? 13 feet long. Is that bigger than King, California King? I believe so. But they say he was one of the giants and they took him down. How'd they take him down? These are people that have wandered 40 years in the wilderness. What do they have for weapons? God. That's how they did it. And that's pretty much it. And Joshua took all those cities. And you realize they were cities. Sometimes you read Joshua or sometimes you read the Old Testament, you get the impression that they were nations. They were not nations, they were cities. And it's chapter 12 that sort of clarifies that for you. There was a king in each city. And it's those cities that Joshua and Israel took over. Jericho, Ai, Bethel. All the cities are listed here. Jerusalem. But there's something here in the chapter as you keep reading. And the reason I'm putting together, you realize that when the Bible was written, there was no chapter division. No chapter division. So there's not a break between chapter 12 and 13. They're actually part of the same thing, although as I, as I looked at the commentators this week, verse 1 of chapter 13 is an interesting verse. I don't know how to convey it to you, but it gives the appearance that some time has passed from the conquering of the 31 kings to the time 13 begins. Now I read one guy and uh, one commentator said this, it took Joshua 10 years to defeat the 31 kings. What do you think of that? Well, we know it only took him two days with no night, because you know what happened, right? There was no night, so two days were filled with sunlight and he defeated 10 kings. So I, don't, I couldn't figure out how he came up with 10 years to defeat the 31 kings. The verse says something different, okay? I threw that commentator out, okay? I still have his book, though. Because it doesn't fit in with the theme of Joshua. The theme of Joshua in chapter 13, notice what it says. When Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Dan, is that us or no? I don't think that's us, is it? We wouldn't be old and well in van. Bob, I don't even think it's you. <laughs> old and well advanced in years. What does that mean to you? Does that mean 70? Does that mean 80? Rudy, does it mean 90? What does it mean? Old and well advanced in years. Does anyone know who wrote the psalm that says, the Lord has granted three score and ten, and if by strength, tenth, four score. Do you know everybody says David wrote that psalm? Can I tell you who wrote the psalm? Moses wrote the psalm. Now I'm getting you to think today, because Moses wrote the psalm that says, if by strength you're going to live till 80 years old. He wrote that psalm before he got to Mount Sinai. So you see, at age 80, Moses was planning to pack it up. But something happened on Mount Sinai. When he saw that burning bush, it gave him 40 more years. Yeah, it's Moses who wrote the psalm, not David. David didn't leave till 80. Moses was planning this was it. And something happened when he saw that burning bush. He was well advanced in years. But something happened. I was talking to someone recently about this, and they said, no, it's because he ate manna in the wilderness for 40 years. That's how he extended his life. He went gluten-free. That's what? <laughs> hey, I'm only telling you, that's what someone told me, OK? You know I had a quick answer, right? I also have a quick answer, right? I said, didn't he eat quail? 
I'm just saying, okay? Well advanced in years. How old was Joshua? We know if he was the same year as age as Caleb, we know Caleb was over 80. Because he says, hey, it's been 40 years of wandering. I'm as strong now at 80 as I was at 40. That's, that's Caleb. But well advanced in years, meaning I think this guy's close, choosing 10 years, but not 10 years of conquering the land, 10 years of enjoying peace in the land. And God says, no more. You're not in this land because you defeated 31 kings and you defeated the two kings on East Jordan. It's not time to sit down and rock in the chair, Joshua. That's what God's saying. That's why this verse is here, because Joshua says, I'm in the promised land. Everything is taken care of. In fact, there's New Testament parallels to this section of Joshua. Now, they're not quoting Joshua, but if you look in Tom Dodge's Bible, you're going to say, you're going to see a little note that says, parallel Joshua. Parallel Joshua. And there's actually three places in the New Testament that parallel this. Now today, when you leave here, you're going to say, Rudy, I never knew that was talking about Joshua. It is. Because you're going to hear the reference here to this very verse that says, you've been in the land too long. It's now time to do something, Joshua. You've got to divide up the land. It kind of lets you know that what happened. Everyone was still at Gilgal, Nelson. Everyone was still at Gilgal. They weren't going to take the land. God said to him, you are very old, and there's still a lot to do. Age does not. Take away your responsibility. There's still a lot to do. It takes us to our first reference. Matthew chapter 9. Is there a reference for Joshua in Matthew chapter 9? I would hope you would add it to the center column reference. Actually started a New Testament this week. Interesting translation. Um, it's translated by a Brazilian, and he translated the original Greek and Hebrew in English, so you figure it out. He took the original Greek and English, and instead of transfer, uh, translating it in Portuguese, he translated it into English. Amazing translation, by the way. Not bad. Not bad. Uh, so here, chapter 9, just to paint the picture. Chapter 9 is a great chapter in Matthew. I know you guys studied it recently, and hopefully after you studied it, you reread it and said, wow, it's really great. Because Matthew chapter 9 is not the chapter that you think it is. Matthew chapter 9 is the chapter where Jesus has reached a place where he says, I'm doing more healing than I am preaching. Now, in case you don't know this, Jesus was on a timetable. Did you know Jesus was on a timetable? How many here knew that Jesus was on a timetable? You should, because when he was baptized, he said, this is to fulfill God's plan. And if we go back into the book of Daniel, time for a commercial. Okay? Starting the third week in August. I know it doesn't affect you guys, but I'm at least telling you, I'm preaching on the book of Daniel in Fremont. So Daniel chapter 1, third Sabbath in August. Okay, Daniel. We're going to go through Daniel. But for those of you who haven't studied it, when you get to Daniel chapter 7, it deals with the nations in relationship to God's people. And we have something called the years that God took off for his people. 2300-day prophecy is in chapter 8. And of that, God took off... Who remembers how many years? 490, remember? 490 years, okay? 
You remember that? How many weeks? 70 weeks are cut off for your people. <clears throat> 69 of them, Jesus will come. The, uh, the, we're talking chapter 9 now. And in the middle of the week, he'll be crucified, which means three and a half years. Jesus had three and a half years of ministry. He found out he was spending all of his time healing people. Remember, did Jesus come to heal physically? No. Why did Jesus come to the earth? To save mankind, okay? And he needed to get the message out, so chapter 9 is important because it shows you Jesus is healing all these people, but he calls Matthew and he calls other disciples, and remember the significance of calling Matthew. What number was Matthew called? Somebody say it. Seven, okay? Because who had he called before that? Simon, Peter, his brother, Andrew, James, John, and then who? Philip, Nathaniel or Bartholomew, and then the next one was Matthew. Matthew was number seven. Significant here. Matthew puts himself in there to say, hey, I was here. Um, Jesus heals the little girl, 12 years old. Uh, Jesus heals the woman who had the issue of blood 12 years, both significant, 12, okay? Got it? How many disciples did he call? 12. The next two miracles in Matthew are not in Mark and Luke. And there are two healings. One is two blind men come to Jesus, not one blind man. Two blind men come to Jesus and say, we want to see. He heals him. And something else happens. A deaf man comes. And what happens? Healing. Are you wondering? Pastor, this doesn't sound like Joshua 12 or 13, does it? Wait a minute. We haven't finished the chapter. Jesus says, the eyes of my disciples need to be open. Their ears need to be open. This is Matthew recording it. Jesus says, I am sending you guys out because I need help. Did you know God needs our help? I mean, think about it. If God sent angels to everyone, wouldn't everyone become a believer? At least for a little bit, right? Who are you apt to believe more, an angel or somebody else? It says here, verse 35, the reference to Joshua. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing, how much? Every. Was there anything he did not heal? It says here, let me read it again. You guys, uh, Bridget, this is for you. This is one of Bridget's verses, by the way. If you want to know one of her verses, this is the one. I can't tell you how many times she told me. She says, Pastor, it says he healed every disease and sickness. Did he leave anything out? Nothing? He didn't leave anything out, did he? Isn't that what you always tell me? She always tells me this. She said, Pastor, he, le he left nothing out. He heals every disease and sickness. What's the difference between a sickness and a disease? Can we use modern terminology? In modern times, we would say a sickness is something that somebody brought on themselves. You know what happens. You know, you didn't sleep. You, you ate that box of chocolate this week that somebody gave you, and you knew you only should have ate one or two of them, but you ate the whole box. Okay? And what happens? Stuffy head, coughing, okay? Or you went hiking, ate all those marshmallows, and now you're all stuffed up. You understand? Okay? You got the story? This, I'm only saying this is, may not be the Bible definition, but the modern definition is that disease is something not necessarily we can control, but sickness is something that we've put, put on ourselves. And it says Jesus can heal every disease. And it says he did, by the way. Joshua yet? I would hope somebody's saying, yeah. It didn't matter what the king was like in those cities. He defeated 
all kings. Whether it was Sihon, king of Heshbon, or Og, the giant of Bashan, or whether it was the king of Jerusalem, it didn't matter who they were, he defeated every single one of them. Big ones, tall ones, five together like five fingers on the hand. You remember those guys? He threw them in the cave at Makeda. It didn't matter who they were. And then it says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless sheep with like a, without a shepherd. Now, as we've gone through the book of Joshua, I hope that none of you have thought that the Bible or the pastor has said that Joshua and all Israel killed every single person that they came in contact with. Who believes that? I would hope nobody here believes that, because it never says that. In fact, we just looked in chapter 12, and what did it do? He defeated and killed the kings. So all the people are like what? Sheep without a shepherd. He didn't kill all the people. Now you might say, wait a minute, pastor. Yes, some of the cities he burned to the ground. Can you name them? AI, any other ones? Yeah, there was a couple others, but Jericho, he didn't, he didn't burn to the ground. What happened to Jericho? It fell to the ground, okay? What about all the people? It doesn't say every city he went in, he killed all the people. It doesn't say that. Now, before we go on, I think I need to remind you, in case you thought that. I hope you still have your finger in Joshua, because notice what it says here in Joshua 13. Joshua didn't kill all the people. What would happen if the land was completely annihilated of all those people? What would happen? Actually, Deuteronomy tells you what would happen. Moses even said, don't kill all the people at once. Do what? Systematic genocide. Isn't that what Moses said? <laughs> what did he say? Give them an opportunity to be saved. Isn't that what he said? That's what God said. Notice verse 2, 13, 2. I want you to listen to it. This is the land that remains, the regions of the Philistines, the Gershites, and you know who they are. Who knows who they are? You ever heard them before? Who remembers David's wife, daughter of the king of Gersha? Abigail. Who remembers what their son was named? Absalom. In fact, he fled from his dad after he killed his brother Amnon, and where did he go? To his dad, the king. They were still in the land. The Philistines, did Joshua defeat the Philistines? No, they became what? A big thorn in the flesh for Israel, didn't they? In fact, who came from the Philistines? You know the name of their five cities? Everybody knows the name of their five cities. Gath and Gaza, the two Gs. Who came from Gath? Goliath from Gath. How many brothers did he have? Four. The five brothers, okay? Were they all giants? And what about Ekron? What about Ashkelon? Okay, you remember all these? These are the five cities in Ashdod. You should know those, okay? Two G's, two A's, and an E, okay? And who else? And in the south, the land of the Canaanites, the Zidonites, Lebanon, all of them are there. Notice verse 6. He didn't wipe out all the people. Don't ever have that concept. God wasn't that cruel, okay? It was an opportunity for salvation. Jesus didn't only come to Israel. Notice what it says. When he said that to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. This is Jesus. He looks at the task and he says, I can't do it by myself. 
Does that sound like Jesus? It sounds like that was his mission. His mission was not to go into all the world. His mission was to establish the center for sending out people. And they were to take the gospel to the world. Joshua was well advanced in years. Jesus said, you guys have been with me three and a half years. It's about time. I mean, I'm sorry, one and a half years. It's about time you guys went out. You guys have been with me too long. It's time to go out, and of course, everyone knows that Matthew chapter 10 is what? Say, the sending out of the 12, okay? You've been here too long. How long have you been here? Are you becoming well advanced in years? Does God just call us to comfort? It's amazing. Joshua, the land is still before you. You just weren't supposed to defeat 31 cities. You weren't supposed to go to each city in the Central Valley. Do you ever remember that? You guys remember that, those of you around in the 50s and 60s. What did they do? They went to all the cities in the valley from Sacramento all the way down to Bakersfield, and what did they do? Let's get a, a, a church in every city. You ever remember that? Somehow having a church in every city is supposed to be it. No. Everybody sets up shop. No, Jesus says that's not it. Joshua, that's not it. You are just to defeat 31 kings. What about the Philistines? What about the Amalekites? We won't mention the Amalekites. What was Joshua's main task? Moses said, Joshua, when you inherit this land, you get rid of the Amalekites. What did Joshua do? Oops. Who likes to deal with the tough people? Man. What was Saul's first task? From Samuel. Get rid of the Amalekites. What did Saul do? I kept Agag alive. I kept the best sheep, the best looking people. Who was the only one who got rid of the Amalekites? David. And the only reason David did it is why? Because he took David, they took David's wives. <laughs> and if David didn't go pursue him, what was going to happen? His men was going to take care of him. And nobody likes to be a spot of blood on Joab's shoes. Even though it was his nephew, Joab threatened it. And he went and wiped him out. But he accomplished God's purpose. Yeah, judgment was to be on some people, but not everybody. We already have the record of Rahab being saved. And you know, I always remind you of this because I want you to remember because my daughter remembers it. Remember, Rahab married Salmon. Not Salmon, Salmon. And they had a son by the name of Boaz. And Boaz just couldn't find the right woman. There was nobody like mom. But somehow when Ruth came from Moab, he said, man, she's just like mom. <laughs> and they had a son, and they named him Obed. Don't you love that name, Obed? And Obed had a son by the name of Jesse. And Jesse had a son by the name of David. And, of course, the Gibeonites. Salvation is open to these people. Joshua doesn't want them saved. God says, you're getting well advanced in years, but guess what? You still have a job to do. You ready? First one, Matthew 9. You still have a job to do. The disciples, Jesus sent them out. Hey, I can't do everything. The next one is Acts. Acts 13. Love Acts 13. That's a chapter you should have memorized. It's a chapter you should know. I know it's a very long chapter, like 60 verses, if I remember, 52. But it's 
one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. It really is. Because not only is it the pivotal chapter that changes the book of Acts, and really it divides the book of Acts in two. The first 12 are all about the apostles. But chapter 13 is about taking the gospel to the world through the apostle Paul. And it's really the first few verses that sets the stage for when the reference to Joshua comes, okay? Now this one's a little bit clear cut. In fact, your, your Bible might even refer it back to Joshua, but most do not, okay? Mine does not, okay? Uh, but it is a reference. Notice what it says. The church at Antioch, verse 1, there were prophets and there were teachers. Don't you think that's a pretty good church? I mean, if your church is filled with prophets and teachers, what more do you need? The, preachers are, the prophets are the one who's condemned you, and the teacher is the one who educates you, all right? Isn't that the way it is? Notice their names, Barnabas. Did you know Barnabas was a prophet or a teacher? I would say he was a pretty good teacher. Simeon, called Niger, meaning the area that he was from. Lucius from Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Good list, huh? While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, now, you have to ask, is this an audible voice? The Holy Spirit said, did you know the Holy Spirit could speak? We know the Holy Spirit can speak because Romans 8 says what? He utters our prayers and groanings to God. He tells them what they mean. Not that God doesn't know what they mean. It says the Holy Spirit said. Who did he say it to? Here's what the Holy Spirit said. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. If you ever want to know how the gifts work in the church, there it is. It's the Spirit who decides who does what and who gets what. It's not you who say to the Spirit, you know, Holy Spirit, I want to be a preacher. Spirit might say, Better not to be a preacher. The Spirit spoke to who? Or to whom? Who did the Spirit speak to here? It did say there was prophets there, didn't it? And teachers already? Spoke to the prophet and said, Set apart for me Saul and Barnabas. Notice he didn't speak to Saul and Barnabas. I'm trying to paint the picture here. What happens? The Spirit is in charge of everything. Set them apart for the work that I have called them. They laid their hands on them and sent them off. Did the Spirit say set apart John Mark too? Apparently he chickened out after being on the island of Cyprus. But now we're getting to the section, reference to Joshua. Verse 16, Paul stood up in the church at, uh, as it is here, Antioch and Pisidia. And he said, men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. There it is. He's got everyone's attention, doesn't he? That's all who was there, folks. Sorry, no women and children. Listen to me. What does he say? The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of their country. He endured their conduct for 40 years in the desert, and he overthrew the seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to his people as an inheritance, and this took 450 years. It's a long time, isn't it? Is that well advanced in years? 
450. Enoch never made 450, did he? Noah made it. Says at age 500 he started building the ark. Well advanced in years? Methuselah? He, was, he wasn't even middle-aged, was he? Well advanced in years. Paul is making a reference to chapter 12 and 13 in Joshua. He said they overthrew the nations, but guess what? There was still a job to do. There was still a job to do. Paul set aside to do the part of that job that Israel failed to do. God has given us the same job. Now, there's one other reference. Hebrews. Did you think Hebrews would have a reference to Joshua? Oh, you good scholars should e even know what chapter it's going to be. Everybody should know Hebrews chapter 4. Now, I have to say, I hope you have New King James and not Old King James, okay? Because New King James makes a little tiny mistake here, okay? But we wink at it because now they have the New King James, okay? And of course, chapter 4 is talking about what? A promise that God made to his people. What did he promise them? Well, he promised Adam and Eve after one day of being created, he said what? I've given you a day of rest. And then he promised what? The children of Israel, when he led them out of Egypt, what did he promise them? He told them what? I'm going to give you rest. In fact, he even told it to Joshua. Did you find it? Did you find the reference to Joshua here? Maybe your verse is saying Jesus, but it should say Joshua, okay? Notice what it says here in verse 8. For if Joshua had given the people of Israel rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for God's people. We love that verse. In fact, nobody ever reads verse 10. It's almost like Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Who reads verse 10? Everybody knows verse 8 and 9, but it's verse 10 that parallels this verse 10 that fits into everything that we're talking about today. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's 2, 8 and 9. Who in the world reads verse 10? You should read verse 10. It says, because you're created in Christ Jesus for good works. Verse 10. Here it is. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from him. Let us therefore, you would think verse 11 would be in chapter 10. You realize t chapter 10 of Hebrews is what? The salad chapter. It's the salad chapter. We'll have a sermon on the salad chapter, Rudy. But here, we'll just talk a little bit of lettuce. Okay? Let us what? Therefore, make every effort to enter the rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. What was their example of disobedience? I'm not going out to those people. I'm not going to do anything. Joshua, you've been sitting there too long. Get up. Do you notice it was God who said to Joshua? Joshua, you're getting well advanced in years. It's time to get up and move. You got more stuff to do. There's nothing we can do to improve on God's salvation for us. However, there's something we can do to improve on salvation for other people. 
And that's what God wants us to do. That's the task we have. Joshua, you just didn't conquer 31 cities. It's now time to get up and move. Joshua didn't give them rest. Because if Joshua had given them rest, there would be no rest for God's people today. Now, we realize this talking about Sabbath, but we're also talking about conquering. It's one thing to remember what God has done, but it's another thing to remember what He can do. It's not just what God has done, it's what He can do and what He wants to do for all of us. Joshua 13, tough chapter. Here's what it says. It's a very tough chapter. In case you were wondering, 13. <clears throat> Starting here at verse uh, 13, gives a sad commentary, just in case you're wondering, is the pastor stretching things today? Absolutely not. Notice verse 13. But the Israelites did not drive out the people of Gesher, remember? David married his daughter, king of Gesher, and Maaka. So they continue to live among the Israelites to this day. What did God say if you let them continue to live with you to this day? What's going to happen? Do you know evil has a greater force on you than good? Did you know that? Evil has a greater force on you than good. If you watch one hour of evil, it's probably going to take you 10 hours of watching good just to kind of neutralize it. You can spend a whole day in church. One hour will wipe it out, okay? Evil has a greater influence on God's people than good. Verse 14, love this verse. I don't know why, but I kind of love it, and I'm going to tell you why. But to the tribe of Levi, he gave no inheritance. Since the offerings made by fire to the Lord, the God of Israel, are their inheritance, as he promised them. Why in the world is that verse there? In fact, they say the verse twice. Look at uh, the last, last verse of the, uh, of the chapter, verse 33. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance. The Lord, the God of Israel, is their inheritance, as he promised. Twice in that chapter. Why does it say that? Because, you see, Israel wanted Levi to go and convert everybody else. Wait a minute. There can't be a parallel to that today, can it? It can't be that Israel wants all the Levites or the pastors to go and do all the conversion. It can't, there can't be that parallel today, can there? Levi was not supposed to go and conquer. They settled in the communities that the people conquered. Why? They were there to be teachers and instructors. The people were to be the conquerors. Yeah, Levi did not receive an inheritance. But Israel has an inheritance waiting to be received. Jesus says he looks out and the harvest is waiting to be harvested. It says he sends out workers. In the church of Antioch, they were praying and the Spirit said, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas. They're going out. And they went out. Hebrews says, Joshua didn't give them rest, but let us who are living in these days take the responsibility to be obedient to the call that God has given to us to take his message to the world. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the book of Joshua. And sometimes we don't know how influential the book of Joshua became, not only to Jesus and Paul, but to the, us as a church as well. Father, we don't know how long Joshua sat there contemplating what his future was going to be like, 
maybe how many years he had left before he died, wondering if maybe he too would be taken to heaven like Moses. But you spoke to him one day because Joshua still knew your voice, and you said, Joshua, you've been sitting here too long. It's now time to get up and divide up the land. Father, we have a great task before us. Seems like more people are being born than people that are being baptized. There's more people that are being lost than are being saved. We know, Lord, you can give the work to angels, but instead you give it to us. And Father, may we accomplish the purpose so that we and those with us can enter into the rest that you have provided for us. In Jesus' name, amen.